Hi, happy Thursday. It is 10 o'clock. It's time for the hospitality hotline. If you're joining us live, please remember you can submit questions like right now in the moment and I will answer them on the fly to the best of my ability. If you're watching this after the fact, also remember you can submit questions um, on any hospitality topic um, anytime through our website. You can DM me, you can comment, you can send a carrier pigeon. Just give me your questions. This is the most fun. So this week we are talking about dinner parties. And when I threw this topic out, I knew that I would get some good questions. And the ones that I have today to answer are fantastic because they really are gonna allow us to talk about the heart of a dinner party. Even though I know, I know, we need to talk about the logistics of a dinner party, but that's a different subject for a different platform. I'm taking notes and I can tell by the questions. Um, I have some ideas on some ways for us to learn how to do dinner parties together. But today, I'm gonna answer four questions about dinner parties and I'm not gonna use names, so I wanna remind you that these questions will always be anonymous so that you don't need to worry about your identity being you know, posted online. Okay, question number one. I always have such a hard time knowing how much food to serve when hosting a get-together or dinner and end up with a ton of unwanted food. How do you know how much food to serve? Such a good practical question because among other things, a dinner party is about serving dinner. So right out of the gate, there are just some rules, like some wisdom that I wanna throw out. That Number one, I would never serve something at a dinner party that you have not made before. Because here's what I've learned just in cooking and specifically in the last year cooking all of Ina's recipes, I've learned that when one recipe says serves six, like serves six what? Mm -hmm serves six mildly hungry adolescents, serves six gorillas, serves six you know, men who want seconds, like serves six is not a helpful thing for me. And I learned about Ina that most of her yields are grossly underestimated. She would say that a batch of soup serves six and it would make, you know, six quarts. Well, a quart is not a serving. So don't don't serve something that you've never made. And so the way that you're gonna judge how much of something to make is because you've made it before and you know how much it yields and you have a frame of reference. Apart from that, the next thing you wanna consider is the gender and age of the people at your gathering. Are you serving women only? Are you serving men and women? Are you serving young children, they eat less. Like all of these dynamics kind of play into what a serving size is. So you do need to give some thought to that. But more than anything, apart from getting like clogged up in the math of the whole situation, I want to encourage you to throw the party. Throw the party, feed your people. And it's important to consider the food and the quantity and all that, but I see a lot of people get really hung up on trying to sidestep the perceived inconvenience of having leftover food. You're gonna have leftover food, you, you are. A dinner party is not the situation where you want to run out of something because if you're serving 12 people for dinner and you only have eight brownies, you're either gonna have to get crafty and give everybody half a brownie or someone's not getting a brownie. You don't wanna, you don't wanna run out of food at a dinner party. Now, a get together, a baby shower, um, maybe a book club. If you run out, then you run out. Like, it's fine, the, the dynamics are different. But a dinner party is you have invited people in to eat a meal and they're expecting, you know, to eat dinner. So you don't want to run out of whatever it is that you're serving. So embrace the idea that you are gonna feed your people Embrace the idea that, yeah, you may need to make a double batch of something so that if someone wants seconds, you can say yes. And that comes with the reality that no one may want seconds and you may have an entire extra pan of potato casserole. That's just part of the territory of throwing a dinner party. So let's shift our mindset a little bit and shift our hearts to do whatever it takes to feed our people and never serve something that you've never made before. Um, next question. <clears throat> I'm going to read this in its entirety and then I'm going to answer it as two separate questions because I really think it's two separate questions. Here's, the, here's, here's what it says. 
What is the easiest, prepare mostly ahead of time, dinner party meal? People are supposed to arrive in 15 minutes. There's dirty dishes in the sink, the dishwasher needs to be unloaded, you still need to take a quick shower, and there's a little kitchen prep work to be done. What do you do first? I genuinely think these are two questions, even though they were smashed together like one. So I'm, I'm hoping these are two separate questions. What's the easiest, prepare mostly ahead of time dinner party? Okay, here's what you're looking for. You are looking categorically for things that can hold, assuming you're serving a hot dinner, excuse me, <coughs> got choked up. You're looking for something that can hold and is not gonna require last minute attention. So if it's my, my number one favorite dinner party menu, it's to serve beef bourguignon. It is elegant, it's delicious, it's kind of fancy because it's French and it's beef but you make it the day before, you heat it on the stove, you put it in bowls with crusty bread, and that's dinner. It's, it's amazing, it tastes amazing, it looks beautiful, and it's super easy to hold on the stove until you're ready to serve. In that same vein, casseroles like lasagna or other kind of pasta bakes or things that can, can be cooked and then like kept in a really low oven without drying out, those are ideal. Also, if you have been following along and doing the roast chicken challenge, then you know that roast chicken can sit and rest for up to one hour and still be piping hot before you carve it. I would say roast a couple of chickens and time it so that you're taking the roast chicken out of the oven when your guests are set to arrive. So let's say everybody's coming over at 6.30. You work backwards, you do the timeline, you take the chickens out of the oven at 6.30, you put them on the stove, you walk away. Then, when you're ready to serve dinner, you go in there and you carve the chickens and dinner is ready. Now, there are some nuances to that and I, you know, some variations we could talk about, but it's not a bad choice. Roast chicken is not a bad choice for a dinner party menu. Um, one of my little tips is make your appetizer and your dessert something that do not require cooking. So, um, that's just a, sanity saver for me. I, I don't want to be cooking an appetizer right before my people arrive, nor do I want to be cooking a dessert. Okay, the second chunk of that question, which I'm going to treat like its own question, people are supposed to arrive in 15 minutes. There's dirty dishes. You haven't taken a shower. There's kitchen prep work. What do you do first? Look at me. We we really, I, like with all the love in my heart, I want to scoop you up and bring you into my world for a minute and say, we need a timeline. We need a timeline. You, like if all of those things have been smushed into the last 15 minutes before your people arrive, we need a timeline. There's, I could talk for an hour on this about how the logistics of dinner parties work. In fact, I have taught a class on this, dinner parties start to finish. Number one rule, I don't care how much this seems counterintuitive, the first thing you do on the day of a dinner party is you get up, you take a shower, you get yourself completely dressed, fully haired, fully made up, made up. You can wear something different so you can just pop on a shirt, but do not push getting yourself ready to the end. From 20 years of experience, I will tell you, that's a mistake every time. I never regret the decision to get myself ready early in the day. And then if I need to fluff a little bit, if I need to recurl my hair, if I need to put on some extra lipstick, if I need to adjust some things, that's a five minute fix. If I'm starting from scratch at the end of the day and something has gone wrong or something unforeseen has come up, taking that shower it just feels like the worst time in the world. And then drying your hair and all that. Get yourself ready first. Try it next time, prove me wrong. Get yourself ready and see how that goes. Run that dishwasher and empty it two hours before your party starts. It's the best gift you can give yourself to start a dinner party with an empty dishwasher. Um, reduce that last minute kitchen prep to as little as possible, kind of what we just talked about. I, I would never choose a menu for a dinner party that requires me to be in the kitchen last minute because a dinner party is meant to be time spent with others eating dinner. So I, I tend to say, um, Reduce that, change your menu. If you're in the kitchen last minute, let's choose something different. Um, and then finally, like I just, I want to, uh, I really want to emphasize again, the timeline is your best friend. I, I get out a piece of paper, I tape it up on my kitchen cabinet. My, my children have seen this their whole life growing up. 
if we're having a party, there's my timelines on the kitchen kitchen cabinet taped, and I'm crossing things off. And I start at the end and work backwards. So start at seven o'clock. People arrive. Okay, start working backwards time-wise so that you have a realistic timeline of what needs to happen and when. I hope that helps. If you have more questions, I'd love to hear your follow-up. Okay, question three. This is a great one. <clears throat> We're gonna get boozy. How do you know how much alcohol to serve at a party? I always get it wrong. Such a good question. Um, and I'm gonna assume always get it wrong means you don't have enough or you have too much. Those are probably the two sides of always get it wrong. There's the technical answer to this question, and then there's the realistic answer to this question. So let's start with the technical answer, which is um, a bottle of wine has five glasses in it, and an ounce of liquor is one serving, and wisdom tells us that per person, it should be one drink per hour per person. That's the technical answer. Never in my life have I seen people pour um, five ounce glasses of wine when left to their own devices. Unless you're giving them really small glasses which would keep them from pouring more. Most people, you've seen the oversized wine glasses and the goblets and all that. Most people exercise healthy pours. <laughs> so if you're gonna do any math, I would say it is four glasses for one bottle of wine. Also, the one ounce of liquor equals one drink works if you've hired someone to tend bar and they're really watching it and they're using you know the little pour thing and then yes one ounce is one drink if your people are pouring their own drinks um, most people are gonna pour more than an ounce into their cocktail so keep that in mind now that being said um, kind of like the answer to the food at the dinner party you don't really want to necessarily run out of alcohol at a party if it's a particular kind of party. Now, if you're having a couple of people over, I don't think you're describing like a, I don't know, like a small group gathering. I think you're talking about a party, like you're throwing a party. It's either a Christmas party or maybe a baby shower or a couple's get together or something where there's a lot of people and a lot of alcohol. I'm gonna tell you the number one um, game plan that I tend to hold to when I'm entertaining large groups and there's alcohol involved is to limit your choices. You do not need to be all things to all people at all gatherings. The larger the gathering, the simpler the choices need to be because you can go deeper on those choices instead of having to have enough of everything for everyone to have all the options for the entire party. You're not a liquor store. You're not a, um, I, I don't know, you, you need to like hone in on what it is. My, my go-to is I love to have champagne because it's festive, it's classic. People who are looking for white wine are usually fine with a champagne or a Prosecco. I usually serve red wine. I like red wine. I think most people like red wine. It doesn't have to be chilled. It can be stored and served at room temperature. And then if you're going to serve a cocktail, limit it to one. If you're gonna have um, something like a mixed drink like mojitos or margaritas or some sort of, I'm blanking, but some sort of like a whiskey sour or something like that, make them ahead in batches, have them in what you're gonna serve them in, and then when those run out, they run out. If you're doing an open bar situation where you're gonna have a bourbon and a vodka and a rum and a mixer and a club soda and all the limes, now you're getting complicated. Now you need to make sure that you really do have, like what if everybody wants a vodka soda with lime? Do you have enough limes? Do you have enough club soda? Do you have enough ice? Beverages at a large gathering can become a huge undertaking. There's a reason people hire bartenders to manage this because it really can be, it can be a lot. So, in the big parties that I've thrown, and specifically uh, when we were doing the Ina project and we were having our VIP parties four times over the course of the year, and we would have 30 to 40 people who were coming to celebrate with us, we would have a big bucket with ice with bottles of Prosecco that we would kind of replenish from the fridge. We would have a station that had red wine and glasses. And then if we had a cocktail, we decided we're expecting 40 people. So we're gonna make this many batches of this rum south side we're gonna put it in pitchers, we're gonna put it on the table, and when it was gone, it was gone. 
That way you're not having to babysit the beverages very much. People have enough options that they can get what they like. Everybody can find something. You're not a bar. You're not a bar. You're there to just sort of give them something fun to hold in their hand and drink. That being said, never forget to include a really fun alternative for people that don't drink. Um, it's wrong to assume that everybody coming to your party drinks alcohol. Um, maybe they're not drinking because they're going to drive the group. Maybe they don't drink for a number of reasons. Maybe they're a recovering addict. Maybe they're pregnant and don't want to tell anybody. There are a lot of reasons why someone who you assume might have a cocktail chooses not to. And there's nothing worse than being the, the person at the party that's just got nothing to do with their hands. Topo Chico is a great one. Something sparkly just in a bottle. Love it. They can hold it. It feels fizzy. If they want to pour it into a cup with a lime, it looks like a cocktail. Always consider the option that someone there does not want to have alcohol. That's really anticipating need. So I hope that answers the alcohol question. Um, let me know if it doesn't. And let's move on to our last and final question. Here it goes. I love the idea of throwing a spectacular dinner party for friends, but I have a rather small kitchen and my dining table only seats four. Plus, my friends don't seem to share an interest in being the dinner party type. How can I get them as excited as I am about dinner party possibilities? Okay, right off the bat. I love throwing spectacular dinner parties for friends too. So I feel like we are kindred spirits in our wants and desires as it relates to this topic. There's just nothing better than a really fabulous dinner party. And if you love to do it, it really can be a joy. It's so life-giving if you love doing it. So I'm excited to talk through this with you. The next thing you tell me is that you have a small kitchen, which is not the worst thing in the world. I have a tiny kitchen. My home kitchen is very small. I have one oven, not a lot of counter space. So a small kitchen does not concern me. But you tell me that your dining table only seats four. You did not mention that you have any other tables, and so I'm gonna lovingly tell you that if you have a dining table that only seats four, you can have a total of four people counting yourself. There's just no way around it. You can't host a dinner party for 12 people and seat everybody at a table when you do not have a table that can seat 12 people. It is such a wise and conscientious thing for us to live within the reality of our limits when it comes to hosting others. This is part of the responsibility of knowing where you are and what you have and using that to the most, to the maximum that you can. I have a dining table that can only seat 10. So if I want to have more than 10 people at one table for dinner, I can't do it. At, somebody's gonna be straddling a leg or too close to their neighbor or something. And I'm all for cozying up. Maybe you could squeeze six people around your table. I don't know what your table looks like. But the reality is, I can't host a seated dinner for 24 people. It would be a nightmare. I don't have the room. So I know my limits and I live within them. Your limits, as it relates to your table, is you can seat four people. You need to accept that. And you either need to I don't know, buy, buy another table if you want more people, or, but like the table that you have today, you can seat four people. It's not a bad thing, it's just the real thing. Okay, I'm not sure when you mean when you say that you describe your friends and their interests, but I know this. When you say that your friends have no interest in a dinner party, I know these things I know to be true. Everybody wants to be invited over. Everybody loves to be included. Everybody loves to be fed. Everybody loves to have their needs anticipated. Everybody loves for someone else to cook them dinner, if that person is good at cooking dinner. Like, I, I think what might be happening is the idea of what you have in your head and the reality of what that looks like, maybe there's a little bit of a, of a disconnect. Because what I know to be true about people and what I know to be true about someone that throws a dinner party with those people and their um, comfort and needs at the heart of what they're doing, that's always a pleasant experience. So, I have been guilty of this and I wanna share, share this with you. Sometimes what happens, particularly when we have a vision of what we want something to be, and I heard you describe it as spectacular dinner parties, Sometimes what happens, and what I have done, and I've spent a lot of time kind of trying to correct this in myself, is we make it about what we want instead of making it about what other people need. So 
Perhaps there have been times when I have made a dinner party about my need to put on a really great dinner party and just know that it was the best it could be and to do all the things and everything's just perfect and I forget that like, oh yeah, the whole reason I'm doing this is to cook dinner for some of my friends and sit around the table for them and that gets lost. So maybe, maybe, I'm totally guessing and forgive me if I'm getting it wrong, but perhaps your friends don't want to be cast as charming dinner party guests in your kind of vision. Maybe they just want to come over and sit at your small table and eat a really delicious meal with you. And maybe something has gotten kind of discombobulated along the way. The good news is you can do what you want to do, which is throw a spectacular dinner party, and your friends are going to want to be invited. The second that we start to shift and see that our heart is not for putting on a good show, it's not about entertaining them, it's not about winning or earning their approval or all that, when we can take that out and make our heart, how can I express love to my friends by inviting them into my home for dinner? Man, you're going to get really good at this and people are going to feel honored to be included around your table. So. The last thing I want to leave you with, and this, this goes for every question, every motive. We can't make people feel things, so you got to throw that away. you got to free yourself from that burden. You're never going to be able to make your friends feel anything. It's very freeing, but you can control how you express your love for them and the motive behind that. So tuck that away. Let me know what other questions you have about this because I want you to feel empowered and able to throw that spectacular dinner party at your table for four with friends that want to join you there. Okay, one in the moment question. This is so exciting. It just came in. How do you keep the conversation going at a dinner party? As an introvert, which may surprise you, I am an introvert, um, conversation does not always come naturally to me. I can talk, but I can talk because I swear to God, this is the truth. I constantly have a little list of questions in my head to kind of rescue me from awkwardly silent situations. I've learned this um, owning a store and needing to interact with clients, most of whom I don't know, and wanting to engage them. This does not come naturally to me. This is a learned skill. The same can happen at dinner parties. You can invite your friends, and maybe it's a situation where you're friends with this person, you're friends with this person, you're friends with this person, you think, let's all get together, won't this be fun? And you get around the table and you, something weird happens with the chemistry and it's just not happening. Okay. There are ways out of this. There are strategies that you can adopt. Um, I think it's I think it's good to have a partner in this. Um, for me, it's my husband. Man, my husband with one look, I can look at him, and he can he can generate some conversation. He's an extrovert. I'm an introvert. So. We can read a room and, and he's great at that. So maybe have a partner that you say beforehand, hey, if things get awkwardly quiet, would you mind chipping in and helping me? There's gonna be a friend that would love to be your partner in that. Second, have some questions. Have some questions, open-ended questions. How did you guys meet? Where did you go to college and what did you study? Tell me about your childhood. I mean, questions that are like, Imagine you're interviewing some historical figure. What are the things you would want to know about someone's story? Don't ask questions about um, that are facts, like, you know, how old are you, or you know, what's your major? Like, t tell me the story. Tell me what you were like in elementary school. Tell me, um, did you grow up with siblings? What was it like in your home? Like, think of think of the story of someone's life and ask a question that sort of like pinpoints some piece of that that they can talk about. And then once they hopefully start talking about that, there will be offshoot questions, there will be offshoot topics. And the great thing about asking story-related questions is you're probably not gonna land in a minefield. If someone doesn't wanna tell you something, they're not gonna tell you. And it's not, you're not asking political questions, you're not asking religious questions, you're not asking, you know, tell me your dark secret question. Like, you're, not, you're, you're just asking about someone's life and everybody loves to talk about their own story and their life. It's true, we all wanna talk about ourselves. So when you ask questions, um, people are encouraged to do that. So at your next dinner party, if things get slow, you know, you've got a little strategy to start asking people about their story. This has been the most fun. I hope that this has sparked and inspired in you a desire to lean in and figure out the dinner party and how to do it 
I love a dinner party. I'm here for you. If you have more questions, send them my way. Next week, we're doing kind of a grab bag of questions that we've been collecting that are not centered around any specific topic. They're really good though. We're gonna dive in. So between now and then, if you have any that you'd like to add to the mix, you know how to find me. Um, you can link in our bio to submit a question, go to the website, DM, comment, carrier pigeon whatever works for you. Thanks for being with here with me here today. Can't wait to see you next week.